1948, the Soviets and the Americans both supported the establishment of Israel, and essentially opposed the Arab states. In 1956, they were on the same side, but a different side. They both opposed Britain, France, and Israel, and supported Egypt, for different reasons in both cases. The point is, they were not the primary arms suppliers to either side in either of these wars, uh, and they were not the principal backer, uh, one on one side and the other on the other side. So this war, or these wars, this earlier phase, as it were, of the Arab-Israeli conflict, was not at that stage polarized along Cold War lines, which is something that came to happen in the 1960s, before, during, and after the 1967 war, which incidentally, Israel fought entirely with French weapons, or almost entirely with French and British weapons. It had some American weapons, but a limited number, and they weren't the high-tech weapons. The nuclear weapons that Israel had and didn't use, it got from France. The aircraft in which it achieved air superiority were Mirage fighters. The tanks that it used were mainly AMX-13s and, and Centurion tanks. It had a few M48 tanks, but um, American tanks. But essentially, its arsenal was French. Um, it was only after that that the Arab-Israeli conflict came to track with the Cold War, with the Arab states, or most of them, identified with the Soviet Union, and Israel, uh, and some other Arab states, identified with the United States. And that led to, and that was the basis for, an enormous increase in the number and sophistication of the West weapon systems involved, and in the destructiveness of these wars. The war of attrition along the Suez Canal, which most people don't even know happened, from 1968 to 1970, was a ferocious, absolutely ferocious uh, uh, phase of the Arab-Israeli wars, fought with not, not just Soviet weaponry, but Soviet combat personnel and combat capacities. Uh, the United States was sending top-of-the-line F-4 Phantom fighters to Israel, even though this was at the height of the Vietnam War, and the production lines in St. Louis for these planes was limited. They were needed in Southeast Asia. They were sent to Israel because Israel and, and let me put it differently, the Arab-Israeli conflict was seen as an essential arena of the Cold War. What happened in the, in the late 60s under President Johnson was essentially that the US administration came to be convinced that it was losing a proxy war, or at least was suffering in a proxy war in Southeast Asia with uh, the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese, being seen as a proxy for China and the Soviet Union, and they were looking for a place where they could punish Soviet proxies. And Israel offered them uh, that ally that could do this, that could win a decisive victory over uh, countries that were allied to the Soviet Union. So both the United States and the Soviets, the Soviets were already arming the Arabs, both the United States and the Soviets poured enormous quantities of weapons uh, into this conflict from 1967 onwards. And my argument in this book is that achieving advantage over one another was much more important to both sides than was any other objective insofar as this conflict was concerned, including peacemaking. It's not to say they didn't want to make peace. What they wanted to do was to get advantage over one another. I came upon a, a document which showed that Secretary of State William Rogers in 1971 had obtained from Anwar Sadat a, uh, an offer to establish via American auspices a bilateral, separate Egyptian-Israeli peace, leaving behind the other Arab countries which had been the Arab demand up to that point, that all the Arab countries negotiate together and that there'd be a comprehensive settlement. So that said, he was willing to abandon this. Rogers goes back to Washington and is told by President Nixon, supported in this by, by uh, National Security Advisor Kissinger, uh, that no, 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 we don't want this. We want the Russians out of Egypt. Let him get the Russians out of Egypt first and then we'll talk to him about Middle East peace. Which is not to say they didn't want Middle East peace. They wanted to win the Cold War more. They wanted to get the Soviets out of Egypt. That was their primary objective. A secondary objective might have been uh, Middle East peace, might or might not have been. And this is not, I would argue, an isolated episode. Um, I won't go through um, the whole litany of cases. I could talk about the Iran-Iraq war. There's some pretty hair-raising stories there. I could talk about the Lebanon war. Uh, let me just leave it by saying that the, what the Cold War did, I would argue, is to exacerbate these conflicts. These were indigenous conflicts, they were, had their own roots, but what the, what the superpowers did was to get involved in them and use them to their own advantage, and quite frequently, uh, this increased suffering, increased the level of violence, uh, increased the destructiveness of these wars. Um, let me talk briefly about the issue of democracy. Uh, the Soviet Union, of course, was never a great paragon of democracy in its third world policy. It never claimed to be, or if they claimed to be, it wasn't terribly sincere. The United States, of course, has always argued that it was a beacon of freedom in the world. 
And in fact, this is true. What the United States is prim primarily meant by this is free enterprise, uh, freedom for individuals. They haven't really, at least in the Middle East, American policymakers, taken terribly seriously support for democracies. And as I looked case by case, from Iran in 1953, to some of the smaller Middle Eastern countries like Lebanon and Jordan in the 50s, to a few other cases, what I saw was that both superpowers were willing to align themselves with any regime, the devil included pretty much, if that regime would uh, be aligned with them in this rivalry with the Soviet Union. What was important was the Cold War rivalry, not the nature of a regime, not whether it was repressive or democratic or anything else. The Soviets claimed to be supportive of social justice. They aligned themselves with hideous reactionary backwards regimes uh, in spite of their proclaimed ideas. The United States proclaimed that it was in favor of freedom. It basically took anybody who would come into the American column if they would align themselves with the United States. And the effectiveness, I would argue, in places like Iran, where a parliamentary democratic regime was overthrown by an American British organized coup in 1953, was to undermine uh, efforts to establish democracy in the Middle East. Now, when I lecture to students about democracy in the Middle East, they're a little skeptical. They say, well, democracy in the Middle East, it's almost an oxymoron. This is a region that uh, is almost a black hole today as far as democracy is concerned. And that's true. It's particularly true of most of the Arab countries. However, it wasn't always the case. And it's, it is not a region that's been, abs that, that's been devoid of attempts to bring about democracy. In an earlier book, Resurrecting Empire, I tried to talk about uh, attempts uh, by, in the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century, in Iran in 1905, to establish constitutional regimes. Before many countries in Southern Europe or Eastern Europe had constitutions, uh, Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire and Iran had constitutions. Um, and there were parliamentary regimes in many of these countries in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, they were weak, they had very serious problems, but the Sudan, Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, uh, and Iran all had parliamentary governments, uh, as well as Turkey at different times, as, as well, of course, as Israel, had uh, parliamentary or, or, or otherwise democratic governments uh, at, at different times in the 50s and the 60s. Now, the problems of democracy don't start and end with the Cold War. Problems of democracy in the Middle East have their own history. And all I argue in this book is that the Cold War did not help at all, and in many cases it hindered. Uh, in the case of Iran, it's very clear that this coup of 1953 took place essentially for Cold War reasons. The United States was afraid of communism. It had an exaggerated fear of communism in all of the cases that I looked at. In fact, communism was not powerful in Jordan or Lebanon either, where American intervention uh, was essentially directed uh, at, 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 uh, uh, in an undemocratic fashion uh, out of an exaggerated fear of communism. And the last thing I would say is about democracy is that any system, the most well-established democratic system, ours, the British, the French, uh, in time of war tends to be affected by the need to concentrate power in the hands of the executive. That's normal and natural in wartime. Think of President Wilson. Uh, think of Clemenceau. Think of Lloyd George in World War I. These are cases where unheard of powers were concentrated in the hands of the executive. Think of uh, President Roosevelt or, or Prime Minister Churchill in World War II. In the most in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the most important democracies in modern Europe, um, this was the case. Imagine the impact of conflict and war, which I, I've argued were exacerbated in the Middle East by the Cold War, on weak systems, like the Middle Eastern systems. The Middle East is a region that has one of the world's oldest traditions of authoritarian, autocratic government. In fact, before most people had government, the Middle East had authoritarian, autocratic government, millennia ago. Uh, my, my daughter is an archaeologist. She's worked in northern Mesopotamia as well as in Yemen. And she's worked on places six, where six millennia ago they had large city-states that were probably pretty autocratic. So it's a region that has its own problems with autocracy. But as I already suggested, it's a region that has had a, a, a tradition in the modern era of attempting to establish democracy. And my point here is the Cold War and conflicts that were exacerbated by the Cold War accelerated, increased this tradition of concentrating power in the hands of the state, in the hands of the, of, of the, of the autocrat, uh, whether it's the Egyptian president or whether it's the king of Saudi Arabia or whoever it may be. Um, and so my suggestion is that this conflict uh, harmed the, the, the possibilities, uh, slim though they may have been in some cases, of a movement towards democracy. Let me conclude uh, by talking about what I've called the new Cold War 
uh, between the United States and Iran. Uh,